Good morning, Dr. Gabriz. Thank you for coming today and talking to us. Thank you for having me. Um, Dr. Robert Gabriz is a research and policy analyst and one of the lead researchers on the cannabis file at the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. So it's an honor. And as well, um, we work collaboratively with CCSA on, uh, on a lot of our files. So I really thank you for um, collaborating with us and being with us today, Gareth. Yes, thanks for having me here. So we wanted to chat with you today about cannabis. We know that it's one of, uh, of the file, like the most important file that you work on with CCSA. And um, went back to school and, and parents um, engaging with their kids in, in conversations. We wanted to equip them with the right information. Um, in this current context, we're hearing that substance use has increased during the pandemic. Does that include youth? Yes, so that's a good question. Um, there have been a number of national surveys looking at the impacts of COVID on substance use, including cannabis. Um, and there are several interesting sort uh, stories, so to speak, on cannabis. So it seems that the majority of Canadians, which is a little bit more than 80%, have actually, like, they remain abstinent from cannabis during the pandemic. And there is about, I would say, 20%, a little bit less than 20% that are still using during COVID. Um, but the good news there is that about of that 20%, about 70% have either reduced their cannabis use or it has remained the same. And on the other hand, there's about, I would say 30% of individuals who reported an increase during COVID um, in the early stages of COVID back in, I would say April. Um, and the main reasons for that was obviously stress, loneliness, um, but also simply boredom and, and a lack of having a, a regular routine were other common factors for the increase. But the good news there is that more recently, so data in July show that only about 5% uh, of people have increased their cannabis use. So it's, it's dropped quite a bit since mm -hmm. the early stages of, of COVID. Um, with respect to youth, we unfortunately don't have a lot of data on, on people under the age of 18 because it's been a little bit tricky to be, to be surveying them in a lot of these national surveys. But there was a recent report that came out, um, I believe it was last month, showing that, again, in early stages of COVID, um, cannabis use has actually decreased among individuals between the age of 14 to 18. And the reason why is because they simply didn't have access to, to the substance. So, um, oh, interesting. Interesting. So that, yeah, so that was earlier on in, in COVID, but we don't know how that sort of changed more recently with the loosening of restrictions. And we haven't been able to make any predictions about how this might change if there is uh, a potential wave two of, of COVID. So, yeah. So, but you were able to make a direct correlation between uh, having access to cannabis and usage. So we believe that the, the fact that not as many youth were using cannabis during the pandemic was the fact that we were in lockdown and they didn't have access to it. That's what I'm hearing. Y yes, exactly. Um, I think a lot of youth, because it's illegal for them to purchase, obviously from, from a store or, or online sort of things, um, they would get a lot of their cannabis from, from friends. So if they were at school or hanging out somewhere in, in wherever they would go, um, that's usually where they would get their cannabis. But of course, since they were in lockdown um, and there hasn't been any school, there hasn't been those opportunities for them to, to access cannabis. I see. Okay, so well, that actually uh, leads well into my next question. So what should parents be particularly aware of if their child is using cannabis. So now we know that, you know, lockdown is not as stringent as it used to be. Kids have more freedom of movement. If, if, uh, if they're using cannabis, what should parents be more particularly aware of? Sure, um, I would say the first thing that, that would be important for parents to know is how often their child is using cannabis and the quantity that in which they are using. So those are two important factors because 
the harms associated with cannabis use are proportional to frequency of use. So the more someone uses, the, the greater risk of harms. And also in terms of quantity, how much THC, for example, is in the products that they're using. Um, so the, the higher the THC, the more risks associated with, with that type of product. Um, in addition to that, I would actually say a more important factor is where they're getting their cannabis from. And specifically whether they're getting their cannabis from a legal source versus an illegal, off their illegal market. And the reason why those are important is because legal, legally produced cannabis, while it is illegal obviously for them to, to purchase it from a store, is tightly regulated and controlled and inspected for um, things like pesticides, molds, and other contaminants, whereas cannabis on the illegal market is, is not so tightly regulated. So individuals who are purchasing from that type of market don't necessarily not only know what's in their cannabis, but might not even know the actual THC levels or CBD if, if that happens to be what they're looking for. Um, and the third thing that parents should be looking for, and I would say is probably the most important is understanding why their kids are using cannabis. Um, so are they using cannabis to cope with stress, with anxiety or other mental health issues, or are they using it more recreationally or socially? Um, and that distinction is very important because using uh, cannabis to cope with stress or mental health is associated generally with heavier cannabis use patterns and, and more problems down the road, whereas using cannabis recreationally doesn't have those sort of uh, predictors. It's, it's not associated necessarily with, with as, many, um, as many of the problems that, that there would be if, if the person is using for, uh, for coping reasons. So I guess that question as to why also is re closely related to the how often. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so just to repeat, so we're, uh, we're helping parents here. So if all of a sudden you know what your kid is using, um, instead of going in panic mode right off the bat, um, mm -hmm. we're, we're asking them to start digging maybe a little bit more and being curious um, with, their, with their teens and being able to ask those questions as to how often are they using and really dig a little bit more as to why are they using, to what you know, to, 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 for what purpose are they using it to control their stress, their anxiety, or they're doing, are they doing it um, to socialize with their friends? Um, because that has different implications. We're talking about quantity um, and where they're getting it from. And, uh, you know, you also asked the, the, the whole thing about THC and CBD, being able to identify what kind of level of THC um, they're getting and and you know, you made a good point of saying if they're going on the illegal market that information um, May not be readily available for them So having those conversation with the kids are is really important if we know that they're starting to be using so these are valuable questions for them to ask um, Wanted to ask about edibles um, Is there one that's less harmful for use if you're approaching like if we're talking about using cannabis and all of a sudden your kid says, yeah, I'm, I'm just eating edibles. Um, ingesting versus inhaling. Is there one that's less harm harmful for the, for the kid? Yes, so, that, so that's a good question. And, and it's something that I get pretty often. And it, it's a little bit tricky to answer because the way I always start off is, is I always say that cannabis is cannabis. So whether you're, you're um, smoking it, whether you're vaping it, eating it or drinking it, it, it still carries some form of, of risk to your health. Um, but at the same time, each product has different health risks associated with them. So for example, um, smoking, smoking cannabis um, has a lot of the same cancer causing agents that tobacco does. So and is often associated with, with various um, respiratory symptoms, including coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and um, risk of bronchitis. Vaping doesn't necessarily carry those same risks, but with vaping, they're vaping. So a lot of the vaping oils have considerably higher levels of THC than, than, than the, the actual cannabis flower. Um, and that obviously poses some health risks, including um, over intoxication. So, over intoxication.
intoxication includes um, anxiety, vomiting, and um, and paranoia. Mm -hmm. So, and and then turning it more to to edibles. So edibles generally have at least the legally available ones have lower levels of THC. Um, the legal limit in Canada per package of an edible is is ten milligrams of THC. So it's it's certainly lower in terms of risks for that on THC. However, edibles take a lot longer to kick in, um, and it, it's sort of hard to figure out how much a person would need to get a desired effect. So some sometimes what often happens is is a person would take a dose and, and nothing is is there's no effect, so they end up taking a little bit more, and then that kind of produces some of the over-intoxication effects. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one risk associated with them. Um, so I, I would say, I, it, it's hard to say which one's safer than, than the other because they all carry different risks, but in the context of COVID, um, limiting the use of any sort of in, inhalable cannabis products is, is recommended. Okay, I see. But again, it's, it's the question of asking, do you know what you're using? And maybe to help a little bit more parents, we're talking about THC and some of the parents out there may not know um, the difference between THC and CBD. Could you just you know, explain in, in, in big terms, but just to be able to guide them through this, because if they're having this discussion and wanting to find out what the kids are using and what kind of level of THC, if we could equip them with the information on the difference between THC and CBD, that would be great. Sure, um, so, so cannabis has a number of different ingredients in it um, that are called cannabinoids, and one of these being THC. So THC is the main active ingredient in cannabis that produces the, the effect. So some of the effects would be um, relaxation, euphoria, um, it lowers anxiety, increases appetite. So that's the main ingredient in cannabis that, that produces, in essence, the high. Um, CBD, under, on the other hand, doesn't produce that type of high, but it has been associated with, um, with some relaxing properties. And there's a lot of research going on now looking at whether CBD is useful for, for various medical um, conditions. Okay. Yep. okay, so that's why we have to be mindful of what they're using and what kind of level. Um, you were talking about the risk specifically associated with vaping where the THC level on cannabis, in cannabis oil seems to be a lot higher than you would find typically on, a, on the legal market for edibles, for example. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So, um, just to sort of set the context, cannabis about 20 years ago had about 4% THC in it, um, and then that cannabis plant has been bred over the years to produce more THC and less CBD, and now the average levels of THC in cannabis is about 15%. Um, which which is three times higher, mm -hmm. whereas whereas some of these vaping oils actually have up to like they they average around seventy five wow. uh, mm -hmm. percent THC and some of them are up to ninety percent so it's it's significantly higher for these products. Um, of course, not all of them have that high levels of of THC. Some of them are pretty pretty high in CBD instead, but. Um, in, in the vaping community, I guess, in, in a lot of the retail stores, it, it's the high THC products that are pretty common and pretty popular. So I, I think it's important um, to, to not only know for parents what type of product the, their kid might be using, but also more specifically the levels of THC in, in those products. If your kid is using, and if you're not talking about it with your kid in a vacuum of information they will go and find their own information through their peers or or through sources that may not be reliable so what we're trying to do is to provide the best information evidence-based information so that parents can engage in those conversations with the kids so that they'll have the proper information to make informed decision it's not in any way shape or form promoting the usage of cannabis 
It's about having informed discussions about cannabis. And then, you know, because you're not going to be with your kid all the time and they may be faced with making decisions. So developing those good reflexes. As a parent, you want to be concerned, but the research clearly shows that a, pro a proportion of young people are using cannabis um, and some are thinking about using cannabis. So rather than just saying, no, don't use cannabis, we, we need to take a different approach and, and ask a lot of questions and educate our children on, on some of the basics of cannabis. So for example, how much THC does your product have? Um, because THC is an important predictor of, of some health effects. So that could be a starting point. Um, where are you getting your cannabis? We know that cannabis off the illicit market isn't, isn't regulated as tightly or probably at all. So we don't know whether those types of products have um, any pesticides in them. We don't know whether they're like the THC levels that are in those products. So um, I think a starting point is asking your child questions so that you can both educate yourselves on, on some of these things because um, whether we like it or not, kids, some kids will use cannabis and they're going to find their information somewhere. So it might as well be from a trusted source. I totally agree. That's a really great point. When we're talking about approaching the matter with curiosity, um, there's this whole thing with the stigma attached to using and, and, um, and being intimidated by talking about it and maybe not using the right language. Do you know through the studies that you've done or with CCSA, the kind of, um, of analysis that you have and data that a compassionate approach works better or um, what, what works best when you're approaching the topic with your kids? Sure. So, so we've spoke to, to you several times and they're very much interested in talking about cannabis. They, they know quite a bit about cannabis in terms of levels of THC, CBD, different types of products. Um, from our own work, they are pretty knowledgeable in, in cannabis and, and different types of products. And what we've heard is they're not only interested in talking about cannabis, but they they're not very interested in just the same just say no um type of type of response because they feel they want they want to have an open conversation and they want to be heard essentially so i think taking a more compassionate approach rather than just saying no don't use cannabis um here are all these materials that say cannabis is bad for you um a better approach is to provide an open environment for them, a safe space for them to, to talk without judgment and, um, and, and just listen to what they have to say because they do have many questions about cannabis and, and, and they are concerned about their health as well. So, mm -hmm. Well, exactly. I think that, and again, um, for parents to be able to, to approach this without being intimidated or I think that we're not telling parents to be experts in the matter. Um, we're telling parents to even show their concerns or, or be curious with their kids and they can come to the CCSA website or our website at Drug Free Kids Canada to find information and share it and, and validate some of the assumptions that either the youth may have or you may have as a parent. And then being able to say, well, let's go find out about it. So I think that um, um, it, it's a great way of approaching the matter to be able to listen to these talks like this and then being able to take it and, and, uh, and get your teen's um, feelings about it or their position about it and being able to validate it through reliable sources is, is a great way of approaching it. So thank you. Um, I think that's all the time that we had today. Um, it's been super useful and I'm sure that the parents will really appreciate the information that you shared with us. Thank you. Thanks again for having me.